Hi, everybody. I'm David Anderson. This is the Monday, April 3rd meeting of the Timex Sinclair online user group. Uh, it's co-hosted by Adam Tranfo. I'm going to spotlight you, Adam. Say hi, Adam. Hello. Hello. Um, today, we have with us um, Bob Fisher. And Bob, I'm not going to, you know, take up too much of his his uh, intro, but Bob was a, a band uh, instructor, high school band instructor. And um, obviously he needed a computer to do things. I'll let him talk about those things. Uh, and that led to him, um, you know, rewriting some software and selling that. And also to his use of Tom Wood's C, uh, profile 64 or 2068 database program um, to such an extent that he put out a couple issues of, of a newsletter called Extensions that had these various modifications to make the program even more powerful or in, in Bob's case, work even better for him, which was Tom's goal in, uh, you know, in producing that program and, and part of the, uh, what he talks about, what Tom talked about in the manual for the program was, he wanted you to use it, but he also wanted you to customize it for your own thing. So with that, I am going to pass the spotlight over to Bob. Hey, Bob. Well, um, well first of all, I'll make a small adjustment. I was a high school band director, but I was mostly a middle school band director. Oh, okay. Um, Even worse. <laughs> uh, most, yeah, well, actually better because most of I just got went crazy with how immature the high school kids were. So I thought, well, if we want to deal with immature kids, I might as well deal with middle school. So that's what I did. Um, anyway, um, I was very surprised when you know, David contacted me because I don't know how he tracked me down. I mean, I, I changed addresses like six times since uh, anything he had, uh, but he got a, he called me one day and I was like, who the heck is this? And uh, fortunately he left a message and I followed up. Um, anyway, uh, I'm not sure, you know, with all the people you've had with Timex officials and insiders, like, what the heck am I doing here? But I can go over some things I think I learned and, and things I did. Uh, one of the most important things I felt I learned from the Timex was that it is not the hardware that is the most important thing, it's the programmer. And even the programmer, it's not necessarily his, his training and all that. It's sometimes just how, um, I don't know what the right word is, or tenacious, I guess. He is about working out a, a solution. And I was not a skilled programmer. I was not a trained programmer, but I wanted what I wanted. I knew what I wanted from my grade book that I made eventually. And uh, I just kept sticking with it. And when people would tell me I couldn't do a certain thing, that the computer couldn't handle it, I just kept looking for solutions until I found one. Uh, my first computer was a Timex 1000 in 1982. I was about 33 years old, I guess, uh, because I couldn't see myself spending the 2000 plus dollars that my brother spent for his Apple II plus. Um, I wouldn't spend, that's like, like $7,000 now. I couldn't, I wouldn't buy one that, that much now. Uh, but I wanted to learn about computers and I thought the Timex might've been kind of a toy. My impression was initially before I ordered it, but I could learn on it. So I ordered that and the Ram pack. So 150 bucks instead of over 2000, that was a good deal. Uh, and then the following year when the 2068 came out, I got kind of lucky that I walked into the JC Penney store and it has all these stacks of 2068s for half price. So I thought, okay, I'll get a couple of those. And uh, eventually added the micro drives. And I think it was Bill Russell did a magnetic ROM switcher. And that was a great thing for running Spectrum games. Um, and, but I bought some useful programs for the 1000 initially, and that was, primarily the grade books that I was a teacher. And that led to my doing some programming. Uh, my experience with every grade book I could find or read about, they all had the same basic three problems. Um, one was uh, the data display. You know, if you're a teacher, you open up a paper grade book and you have uh, a two page spread and you have the names on the left-hand side and you have summaries on the right-hand side side and in between all the days of the grading period for adding grades or attendance. Of course, our grade books only the grades, but, but, the, but the thing with the paper grade book, it was actually a great design because you could literally see everything at once. 
uh, you can scroll, you know, you can move vertically with your eyes up and down to see how students compare to other students on a test or average. You could uh, move your eyes left and right to see how that student is getting better or getting worse. Uh, so it was, a, it was a very good design that you couldn't copy on a computer, certainly not a 32 column computer TV screen. Uh, so what most of the grade books did that I, I saw, they'd show you maybe seven names on the left-hand side of the screen and three to five grades going, uh, grade columns went across. So to see all the names, you had to do a lot of scrolling. To see all the grades, you had to scroll the other way, you know, left and right. Uh, not user-friendly at all. Now, I, my solution was to make two, two basic displays. One that uh, focused on the students. So I sat down and figured out you know, how many students can I fit on one screen? I didn't want any scrolling at all. And I figured out if I had 12 letters for a name plus the grade or their average, whatever I wanted to do, uh, I could show 46 names at one time. Well, the biggest grade book I saw only allowed 50 students total and they couldn't be seen all at one time. Uh, mine was 46 students in, in a class. I could have more than one class at one time. So I was not limited to that number of students. Just That was just a limit for the class. Much like on a paper grade book, if you fill it up the 20, the uh, 35 or 42 names that you can fit, you turn the page and continue on to the next page for the rest of the class. Um, for the grades, I, I made it where you could see one student at a time, but you can see every one of their tests and their average. And so I figured out how many I could fit on that screen and it came to 68. So I allowed 68 uh, grades per student. Um, now, if you compare that with the time, which actually was the best of the other programs I saw, it allowed 50 students, each with up to 30, up to 30 grades. So not bad, certainly better than the rest, but not what I was really wanted. Um, so that brought me to my next, the biggest problem of all of them was the capacity. Now, these are 16K computers. You just don't have much storage space, especially after you get the program written. So um, I found that, you know, if you have the Timex or any other grade book at that time, you would do the grades on one, um, you load it in one class and you do the grades and then you save it out. I would always save it out twice just to be safe. And uh, then you load it in the next class. Well, your first class is now not there anymore. You can't go back to it easily. And you might do that like six times a day. Uh, not very convenient. So uh, what I found was if I made it multiple classes and could store enough students, uh, I could load more than one class at a time and cut that problem down. Well, the first thing I did uh, was to make it where you didn't have to have 30 grades. I mean, all the programs, whatever number they allowed you to have, it seemed to be locked in. So you could, so like Timex would have a, an array for a string array for names, 50 names, that was it. And then a uh, numeric array for, for the um, uh, grades. So again, locked in for 30 grades. So what I did was set up a situation where besides multiple classes, uh, and I could just switch, hit a couple of keys and switch classes. I made it where you could have fewer grades. I allowed 68. No one's gonna use 68 grades that I can imagine, but, but it, it fits, so I allowed it. Um, and I don't think most teachers use 30 grades. So what if you only need 10 grades? Well, now, if you, if you can do that and you can move that memory over to students, well, you can have more students. So uh, for example, I'll use the Timex as my example. Uh, if, I made, if I only needed 10 grades and I had written it a different way, uh, it could have had 121 students in the same memory space. Well, that's enough for half, at least half your students. So I could load like three classes at one time and then you know, save it when I'm done and then load in the other three classes for the afternoon or something. So much more convenient. Um, but I still wanted a lot more than that. Um, because also because my computer program took up a lot more space. It did more things. So I think the Timex had about 8,500 bytes available for storage of grades and names. And mine only had a little over 5,100. So I needed to get a lot more conservative about my storage of grades. Um, the problem was grades took five bytes. Uh, any, any number you know, in the computer took five bytes on Timex. So for the 30 grades that Timex allowed, that was 150 bytes of memory. That's a big chunk back then. 
So what I first did, I thought, well, why am I storing these grades as numbers? I could store them as strings. So instead of giving a grade of 100 as a number, I give a grade of 100 as a string. Well, now I'm down to three bytes. Now all the grades had to be three bytes, so I keep track of where they were, but um, still that's a 40% savings. So again, using the Timex example with 10 grades, I go from 50 to 121, now it's up to 170. So this is really getting good, uh, but I still wanted more. And so I don't know why I didn't think about it sooner because it seemed so obvious when I came up with the solution. But I suddenly realized, you know, a computer byte can store anything from zero to 255. I'm not gonna give grades that high. So I would just store all the grades as one byte each. Well, <laughs> now 50 grades takes 50 bytes. Uh, I mean, excuse me, 30 grades take 30 bytes instead of 150. And on my program, even though it was, uh, had less free space, uh, I could go and, uh, let's see, I think I had room, for, okay, at that point I could store 232 students at one time, it divided into whatever number of classes I needed. Well, that's enough for a whole grading period, and I don't have to keep loading and saving all the time. Um, and if you convert to the 2068, it had five times as much memory for the storage, so I could hold over 1,100. And if I use the 64K RAM pack on the 1,000, I could hold seven times as much, over 1,600 students. So I was storing the entire year's worth of classes. Like if I had six classes in a grading period, and there are six grading periods, I, I was storing 36 classes. And then, then it could allow me to compare classes as they change over time. I could calculate the uh, semester averages and yearly averages. So it just changed everything just because of the capacity. And uh, I still had one more big thing to do. It was the third problem these, all these programs had, and that was speed. Because as far as I know, all of them were written in basic. So was mine. And boy, was it slow. Mine was probably slower than most because of some things I did to save memory. Uh, and, and converting those uh, those bytes of numbers to how you do the math on them took more time. So it could take you know maybe 40 seconds or more to get the averages printed out on the screen for every student in a large class. So the only solution was machine code. And fortunately, that's where Tom Woods comes in. Uh, you know, Tom Woods did his program profile and it showed all the code for the basic and machine code and explained how it worked. I was just amazed he did that. Uh, so for example, one of the slow things is printing to the screen in basic. Well, he printed to the screen in machine code. I just looked at his code, made a few adjustments for where on the screen things were printed, and I was done. Um, calculating the grades, I'm not sure if he had a, a machine code uh, thing for doing numbers or anything, uh, but so I might have had to do that on my own. I just can't remember. But uh, once I had that, those two things, machine code for averaging and machine code for printing, what used to take 40 seconds or more to do, I could do in about a second. So I had the most capacity, I had the fastest, and as far as the displays, that's personal choice, but for me, I liked it. Um, the, um, I, got, I used uh, another key program I used was the Hot Z program that Ray, Ray Kingsley had, I believe. Yeah, uh, and uh, that was a I thought a wonderful program because you could, you could switch. With, I think with one keystroke you could switch columns. One column was to put it put it in the hex numbers, and sometimes that was faster for me. If I just, if I knew something well, that was faster. Uh, other times I wasn't sure of the numbers, so you hit a key and go to the other side of the screen, and you'd have the assembly language. So I love that program. Um, so anyway, so I sold it. Uh, I, 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 when I got done everything and got everything in machine code, I started selling it. I made, I didn't sell very many. Uh, I didn't do it for that reason. I, I, I did it for myself. Um, and I made, what money I did make disappeared quickly because I, um, uh, I did two things. One was, I just want to make people kind of happy. So when I made my newer version, I sent out free, free updates to everybody. And I you know, had their addresses already. So I just sent another copy out. And so, you know, I had to pay for the cassettes and the shipping and the uh, documentation. 
And then I also, since most people are paid by check and most checks had phone numbers on them, I also um, called everybody I could and just asked them, you know, how'd you like it? What problems you have? What would you like to see different, added to it, whatever. So these were not short phone calls. And back then, 1980s, you're talking about paying long distance calls. And so I imagine any profit I made off that thing was spent just by phone calls. But I enjoyed it and, and people seemed to like it. So that made me happy. Uh, that was all I did with the grade book uh, as far as basic things. Um, I did, uh, yeah. Adam had a question, real quick question for you, I think. Okay. Um, so first of all, I'm not really familiar uh, with the Timex 1000 all that much. Um, so profile is it like a compiler or? No, profile, I, I, I should have explained that. Profile, I, I thought it was such a popular program, everybody heard of it. But profile was for both the 1000 and for the 2068. Uh, the uh, you know, 2068 had more stuff, but it was, uh, it was a database basically. A kind of freestyle database. You can mix things. It wasn't like certain things had to go certain places. You put anything you wanted, any place you wanted. It had 15 lines uh, that was you could put data in. And I, th I think it's one of the best programs that ever came out for the uh, 2068 and the 1000. So, so I guess I should back up. So you your gradebook program worked with Profiler together. No, I, I took the profile program and the manual, Tom Woods put all his code for making that program. Oh. You can type that whole, whole thing in yourself from scratch um, and, or make changes like I did later on. Uh, my grade book simply looked at how he did his code and copied what would work for me. I see, I see. So, so like printing to the screen was a machine code, which is way faster. And so I just looked at how he did his machine code and uh, you know, made adjustments to suit my needs, and that was how I did my that part of my program. Did you have contact directly with him, or did you? Yeah, I called him a number of times. Uh, uh, he was very welcoming, very helpful, uh, and stuff. I can't remember all the stuff we talked about, but we did talk about a lot of things. Great. Any other questions about that? <laughs> That's all I've got about that. I have many other questions I've written down, but I'll wait till you're done. Okay. Well, uh, I did uh, three smaller apps. Um, I just mentioned them quickly. One was a word jumble so helper. Yeah. Uh, you go in there. I got to call Tom again. We next fifteen minutes. Okay. Okay. okay that was interesting. <laughs> um, it was a word jumble helper. So you go to the newspaper and you have these jumbles that would have five or six letter words all jumbled up. And so I wrote a program to help solve those. Uh, I had another program, again, from using newspapers that for cryptograms. So the, the, the basic uh, letter substitution cryptograms. So I had a helper for those. And I had another one that helped solve crossword puzzles. So there are my three small programs. And then the other big project they had, which was taking Tom Woods profile program and the newsletter that David mentioned, trying to make things that work better for me, some of which I think work better for anybody, but certainly for me. Um, I can't recall a lot of things I did, but I, I did the first one and um, I thought I might do one or two more, but it turned out I did five of them all together. Uh, it was, uh, I think they ran from six, seven, up to 11 pages, I think. Uh, but you had to type everything in yourself. And when I got, done, when I got the third one, uh, I thought this is getting kind of lots of a lot of typing, and uh, so I thought let me make a tape. You can kind of merge it with your existing profile, and all of your stuff will be typed in already. Uh, and let's see. I, and then when I got to the fifth one, I don't know if I made a tape of that or not. Uh, I got a contact from uh, R, uh, what was it? R RMG R RMG yeah, Enterprises. And they wanted to sell it. I think they were already selling in the plus three version. Uh, they wanted to get the plus five version. And uh, I don't know if I made a tape and they typed in the stuff uh, they made it type for themselves, or if uh, I had already made the tape and they just copied that. But I, they, no, I, I'm sure the deal was they would you know, give me so much each one they sold, but I just said they could have it. At that point, uh, I was just happy to make it up for somebody else. And I might have been about ready to go to the Apple II Plus by then. I'm not sure if it was right then or a little bit later. 
Uh, but anyway, they, they, they were the only people selling it at that time. Um, it did, some things I can remember, I mentioned the, the maximum number of lines you could have was 15. Uh, I did some adjustments with their, with their menu listing, which took a lot of space, and made it where you could do 17 lines. I think later I made it 18 lines. So that's a 20% improvement, so that was pretty significant. Um, let's see. Um, I think I might have done something with the machine code sort, but I can't remember exactly because Tom Woods and I both were involved in that. Um, there were things for uh, math I added in. Uh, I made some changes in how things were printed out. Like normally when you get when you print out a thing, at the end it always print out search is complete. And so I made it where it would not print out search is complete. Uh, it didn't print blank lines between records. So you pr it printed out, you know, a, a thing that's completely filled up 15 or, or a number of lines you had, 15, 18, whatever version you had. Uh, it would start the next one right on the very next line, no separation. So I made it automatically insert a, a line, blank line in between. Uh, a, lot, a lot of things like that. Uh, uh, let me see, there was, I could, you could append two files together if they weren't too big. Uh, you're still limited how much space you had total. Um, little conveniences like, if you had names, people would put first, I mean, last name then first name for advertising purposes. But then they had to do another line with first name, last name, they were doing a printout for something. So I, I had a thing where you could, when you did a printout, you could select an option that would reverse the first uh, two words on the first line. So you could save a, a little bit of space there. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, um, a cursor wrap around to make it easier to get from one side to the other. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, in other words, if you're on the if you're on the first position on the on, on a line, instead of moving that cursor one thing at a time over to the far right hand side, you could just go to the left one space, and that would move it to the right hand side. So now just little conveniences that popped up as I went along. Um, and um, before I forget, there's one other person I want to single out as uh, very important to me anyway. And that was uh, Mike Singleton, who did Spectrum games. Uh, the ones I remember were Lords of Midnight and Doom Dark's Revenge. And what I was amazed by those programs, especially with my grade book, because I was always trying to find a way to save me memory. And he had this thing that had, the first one had 4,000 locations with graphics. And the second one had eight, uh, 6,000 locations. I don't know how you fit that in the spectrum memory, but he found some way to do it. And then the third one, which I, which never got released, but it was supposed to have 16,000. So I love to know how he did that. Maybe I could have gotten even more grades in my grade book, but, <laughs> uh, but he, he was one of my heroes. Never talked to him, but he was one of my heroes. Um, I think he died not too many years ago. Um, anyway, that's the stuff I've done for the uh, Timex. Now, you're Gustavo, you have a question. Okay, no. Hi. Um, do you have a plan to migrate your program to the Timex FDD, or you consider to to move the program to this platform when the Timex? Uh, I I I, I'm not, I don't do any more programming at all, so I don't plan on moving any place. I don't think I remember half of what I did back then. Um, in fact, even when I was writing this, the, these programs, if I went back to them a month or two later, I think, what the heck does this mean? You know, I'd be very confused. But uh, what, I, what I did instead of, when I, when I moved to the Apple II GS, but by that time, you had a lot better programs you could buy. And uh, so with the Apple II and all the, and the PC and the Macintosh, I, I moved my grade book to be um, on the spreadsheets with the addition of uh, keeping track of attendance. Now I got very complicated formulas to make that work. And sometimes they got so long, I, I had some special problems because of the length issues. But uh, I was very proud of those great books too, but I, I don't quite consider that program. I guess in, in a way it is, but I was just using an existing program and I haven't programmed anything since. Adam. Hi, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, I can. I yeah, great. I, I was uh, wondering if uh, how you were using it, were you using it at school, at, at, like in a paper, and you'd write all the grades down on paper, then come home and do it? Or did you have like a computer at school? And did other uh, teachers at, at your own school use it? 
Well, at my school, I was the only person with a Timex. In fact, when I started with all this, nobody had a computer, and if they had their own, that I didn't know about. But as far as the schools, there were no computers in my school uh, for, at first. And then uh, I guess they worked out something where it was the vocational teachers had, I guess, some political pool, and all the vocational teachers got Apple II computers, hmm. and and uh, nobody else did. And uh, it was funny because they didn't know how to use them. I used to go to the uh, home ec teacher and she got two of them and they both sat in boxes. And so I said, can I set this up? You know, I mean, set, set up her in her uh, little closet she had so I could use it. But uh, she's sure, you know, so I set it up, but she never used it and she had two of them. Mm -hmm. um, later on, this the school got a computer lab and they got the, uh, you know, the, what they call the trash 80s. They had those in there. Um, but what I did, I had one, one, Timex 1000, and I used that at school. Uh, just you know, each day I got there, I you know, loaded up either profile or the grade book and uh, did my work and say it as, as, as necessary, and then closed it down at the end of the day. Um, the um, When I got to the 2068, and I had two of them, and I would have one at school and one at home. What did that, uh, other teachers think of it? Like, did they ever see well, it? Did they think it was kind of fun? To... Well, the only teacher that saw mine was the guy I worked with. I was, I was the assistant band director at that school, and we shared an office. And so he saw me all the time. And it was kind of funny because, I mean, people didn't understand computers back then. Uh, and he would, I'd be sitting there putting, like, uh, besides grades, I, you know, I had a word processor, probably M script, I guess. And uh, I would put phone lists, you know, type the, Oh, I, no, I'm sorry, I was, I used profile. So I put the names in profile and then do a printout and with the phone numbers. And he could not understand that. He said, why are you typing it into your computer? Uh, you could just type it on a typewriter on a piece of paper. <laughs> I said, well, yeah. And every time I make a mistake, I got to start over again. And uh, he, st he still didn't understand it. Uh, it was just the craziest thing. I, I was just, he was a smart guy, but not when it came to computers. Hey, Bob, you mentioned using um, micro drives. Yeah. Was that, and I'm assuming that's with your 2068. How did you do that? Um, I can't remember the details. I, I of course, I, 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 I don't remember they work, I had it work with as, as, a, as a 2068 or I used the ROM switcher to go to the spectrum mode. Mm -hmm. I just remember reading about, you know, one of the newsletters about how oh you can put these on your computer and whatever you said to do it that's what I did uh, I assume there was some plug in the back but uh, maybe some special interface or something uh, maybe there's some special code you type in I don't know but uh, I assumed it was something that other people have done but uh, I didn't understand it I just knew it if I plug this into this it works Very and it was cool. a huge huge convenience yeah 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 those things were Nice if you had a spectrum. <laughs> cool. Does anybody else have any questions for uh, Bob? Yeah, I have a, a couple a more. Ton? If you don't mind. Okay, go ahead, Adam. <laughs> yeah, I don't have a ton of questions, but I have a few. Um, well, I was looking on David's site for your program, but I, is it not archived or is it available? It is. Uh, I, yeah, I, I just talked to him yesterday about that. I mentioned to him that I had not seen, like, for instance, extensions that I didn't find um, any issues. And I, I've forgotten so much of what it did. I, and same with the gray book. I've forgotten so much of what it did. I wanted to actually see it. And so he had that time he had not put it up, you know, indexed or whatever. And he get, sent me a, a link to the archive itself. And man, all the stuff that I did on that thing, I couldn't believe how he found this stuff. Uh, now, the gray book that, that doesn't show you know, the code. Um, I, I thought at one time I did do that, but it's not there anyway that I could find. And um, the but the the extensions they're all you know, here's what you type into your computer. So you're talking about the newsletter then the extensions newsletter. Yeah. Newsletter was extensions that was to make profile do more things. Okay. More, get more capacity, so forth. But so grade book the program is lost then like to time. The program itself, yeah, that as far as I know is lost unless somebody has a copy, and anybody wants to. I don't want to sell it, give it away, whatever. It's fine with me. I mean, I gave it basically gave away extensions, so why not that too? You know, we're gonna to have to track down a teacher. 
<laughs> my son is a music teacher i'll ask him if he uses it <laughs> well let's face it the odds are against it you know, yeah I know. Are, you gotta find a teacher you gotta find one that uses computers back then and then find one that actually chose to use it you no know, time hey david found you the, that's yeah. true yeah mm -hmm. power of the internet <laughs> yeah i do wish i still had it but nope it's long gone not that i would use it just to have it for you know, if somebody wanted to mess with it no they could Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Um, no I'm really glad you were able to join us, you know, hang out and, and listen to the craziness that will ensue. <laughs> oh, I will. <laughs> well, I have one more question just in general about Timex is for you, Bob, if you don't, uh, sure. if you're still, yeah. So uh, what retired. do you think about do being, what did you think about getting contacted by David? And what do you think about the fact that there's people who meet up a couple of times a month here in the United uh, States and it, talk about it was stuff? all a shock to me. Um, he, I got the phone call and I, I glanced at my phone and I saw a name from, I don't know what, what city he's from now, but I saw the, you know, the, this location and phone number. I thought, okay, I'd never heard of this person. I don't need a, a new car warranty. So, you know, I, I got in the policy, of, you know, if something like that, I assume it's bad and they want me to leave a message. I hope that word has gotten out to people um, in general. Uh, I always worry about missing something important, but anyway, uh, and then, he left a message though. And so I um, listened to the message. I thought, you got to be kidding me. You know, the first thing reaction was how the heck did he track me down? Because as far as I know, the last address he would have had for me was probably when I was in Somerville, Georgia. And that I left there in 1986. Mm -hmm. So, and I've lived like six places since then. So he had to go through a lot of things to figure out where I am. Anyway, but uh, so I called him right back. And you know, he told me about the, the meeting stuff and how he wanted to do an interview and so forth. And I, I was just shocked by the whole thing. And I, I've listened, I haven't listened to a lot of the, the uh, meetings yet, but I've listened to some, you know, as I listened to uh, Tom Woods and uh, the, the uh, especially the, uh, the Timex people and you know, how you track those down. <laughs> but, uh, it's been fascinating to listen to. Hey, Jay, you got a question? Yeah, um, I was wondering, uh, if he has a list of people that bought the uh, uh, program from him, if he has a list like that to track down an owner or something. <laughs> yeah, that's a good it, point. No, I don't have that, but I wish I'd be other I wish I had. I didn't even think about that. But no, I, I used to have all these things on a, uh, I think the last time I had them might have been when I had Apple II GS, and I might have saved it to one of their floppy disks, but I haven't had floppy disks in ages. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Well, if you cool. typed it out on a typewriter, you'd still have it after all these years. Or, <laughs> or what you can try doing is just dial a, a number until one pops into your head, and maybe. <laughs> well, you know what I probably ought to do? I do. I, I doubt it's there. But when I moved to Hawaii, I did ship you know, boxes of stuff. I found out you could ship uh, books or basically paper. Uh, Theoretically, it's like library books or something like that. But I, anything that was paper, I shipped uh, to say it was fairly inexpensive to ship compared to anything else to Hawaii. And um, I know I've gotten rid of a lot of that stuff since then. But I do have a couple boxes that uh, I probably should scan through just in case there's something there. There probably isn't, but you know, you never know. So I can ever get into my closet and find the right boxes. <laughs> I'll try to check on that and let you know. Excellent. <laughs> I'm all about the paper. Yeah. If I have anything, it's probably just a letter or something. Uh, well, I can tell you, wait a minute, there is a, on your, on your website, there's a review of extensions. That's by Lee Bennett. Mm -hmm. And. Oh, um, good point. Uh, with, I, don't know, I don't know if he did a great book, but he, but he, but, but he did a review of up, up to the fourth version of extensions. And there's a, I think it was Dennis Silvestri um, that did a review of the grade book. There we go. And that's a nice, unique name. Yes. Is, is he uh, the one who I, gave I, it a poor it. review and you wrote a letter to, uh, saying, no, hey. that was somebody. that was somebody else. Dennis okay. Sil this, Tom Woods taught me my, a lesson, a good lesson here. Uh, I, I sent this that thing to a magazine, a newsletter or whatever, and asked if they would have somebody review it. And they did. And they... They made a number of critical things, some of which I thought were ridiculous because like the thing that bothered me the most probably was when he said, you're only gonna have 46 students. And I'm sitting there saying like, what other program does he know 
that allows 46 students to show in one class at one time. And only one book, a great book, the Timex one, allowed 50. Uh, and you couldn't see them all at once. So uh, to me, that was kind of silly. It's like, yours, yours does more than anybody else's does, so let's correct about it. You know? uh, and then he, ha he also reported on, um, uh, let me think, uh, a couple of things that didn't work. And I don't know if he didn't follow directions right or if he got a buggy version. I did write a letter saying that, okay, I'm glad I sent another copy. Mine does not do what he says. <laughs> Uh, no one else ever said that, had, had that problem. So uh, when I was looking at that just last night, I had to do it quickly, but I was doing some scanning of my program, looking at things it said to do. And I can see places where, you know, maybe it's because I'm older, I don't understand things as well, I don't know. Hmm. But that I can see somebody getting confused you know, easily. Uh, I never bragged up being a great writer. Uh, but so I could understand that maybe he didn't follow directions that you know, was carefully, or maybe I should have written them more, more clearly. Uh, but whatever, I, I, at least they did my letter follow-up. Uh, but then uh, Tom Woods told me, you never do a review that way. You always contact someone who already has the program and likes it, <laughs> and that's them to do a review. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't ask Dennis Sylvester to write, write one, but, but that's the same kind of thing. He did write one, he was using it, and he liked it. Excellent, all right, we'll track down Dennis. That's our, That's the next goal. <laughs> I'll double check. I'll look it through here and see if I can find, make sure I got the right name. Yeah, that, that sounds about right. That sounds about right. Very cool. Well, thank you, Bob. That's uh, no problem. That do it. That's really cool to hear about how somebody you know actually used the. I mean, it's amazing to me that you started with the one thousand. You did so much with it, you know. And and Adam is a new uh, one thousand user. He's learning how to to type on the keyboard and stuff. Yeah, well, I have a little advantage of what Ryan uh, <laughs> let me the like a keypad overlay or something. So yeah, to, right. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, it, makes, was, it seems to make it better, but you know. mm -hmm. back then I was a two finger typist, so uh, I, I don't know if I could ever type, touch type on that thing. But is I that couldn't... possible? I don't. I would imagine it's not. I would think it, well, yeah. I, I imagine you could, theoretically you could touch type. But, you, but it was very slow. You said to put more pressure on it. Yeah. Uh, but uh, yeah, it was that was a that was definitely a problem. I never had a different keyboard to use with it. So it was very slow. Yes, exactly. Very cool. All right, gentlemen, start your engines. <laughs> well, I would like to hear first um, from Carl about his video upgrades that he's been working on. Carl, are you there? That sounds cool. Oh, Too he says give him hand. a second. Okay. Okay. Well, Adam, do you want to give folks a brief uh, Albuquerque user group update? Uh, well, I gave one last time, and I we didn't the three of us didn't get together, but I did get together with Ryan about a week and a half ago, mm -hmm. and we spent about four hours playing on the one thousand. Um, because I was I just thought you know he dropped by because I had some questions about typing in this program I'm typing in slowly but surely mostly slowly. Um, called Star Blasters by Dan Tanberg. Uh, I think, was that his name? Dan, yeah, Tanberg, because yeah. Uh, he was local to me and he's the one I mentioned I contacted locally and he said that, uh, yeah, he wrote it and it's like never been archived. So I thought it might be fun to type it in. And it, it is interesting because I'm doing Unreal hardware, but I was having some trouble, like, because I was confused about typing in some variable names that had, um, let's see, like, basic keywords in it. And I was somehow confused. I don't know. Looking back, I'm not sure how I got confused by this, um, but I was. And uh, Carl came over and showed me that pretty quickly. And then we uh, used a back bit cart and uh, we were uh, discovering some issues with it and trying to work them out, which are still not worked out. It turns out uh, the ROM um, that's in the back bit cart doesn't quite load the .p files correctly. It loads most of them correctly. and um, uh, Evie's still trying to figure out what's going on. She just did a patch a few days ago um, that I guess helps a bit, but not not with the one program I'm trying to run yet. It helped it a little bit, but not not all the way. So and, we worked with that and just loaded some games and had some fun. And, Ryan, do you have anything to add to that? Uh, am I forgetting anything? I don't see Ryan listed. You're oh, using a um, a little keyboard overlay thing, and there yes. are two companies that I know of that made that I can't remember off the top of my head which one you have. One was by a company called File 60. A little module you stick on your on yeah. your um, keyboard. And when it was new, it had self-stick 
it right. strips. Apparently this did. It, so uh, the, the story behind that keypad is that after Ryan uh, moved out and I guess went to college in the 80s, he um, passed down his Timex 1000 to, I think he said his brother, if I got this right. I can make up anything I want right now since he can't uh, say I'm wrong. He had to defend himself. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he, uh, his, his mother bought um, this overlay for the 1000 for his brother. So I guess he didn't really use it himself until later. Um, and he, I guess it used to stick onto it, but it's not anymore. And it's, mine's just stuck on with some masking tape, which works fine. It doesn't move at all. And it's, it gives a lot more tactile feedback. I don't know how, cause it doesn't look like it should, but it's much easier to find the keys and I like it. I feel like I'm cheating using it, but, um, it works. I'm going to put, uh, so this is, uh, this is the other one is this button set it was called. Um, and this is the color version you have from what I saw in your picture. Yours is black yeah. and white. Yeah. Yeah. It is black and white. Yeah. 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 That one actually sticks up a lot more. It looks like. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm not entirely sure if they were made by the same folks or not. Um, but this one, is this the one that was, I think it was the file 60 that somebody in, in the Buffalo area was importing. Yeah, well, well, David, go back up to, uh, it looks like the back of that one has like extra, like the one I have doesn't have anything clicky like that in it. Oh, really? Okay. No, well, no. Let's, let's pop over to that company and take a quick look. Uh, yeah, that's a great website. Whose company, whose website is that? Uh, that would be fine. <laughs> and I've spent years, years, wait, okay, so file 60 did the button set. So who did the other one? Second base. Okay. All right, so the second base was the, um, I think that was the folks who had the US, right, Altoona was one of their addresses. I'm curious, anyone else in this meeting right now, does anyone have anything like this? Anyone else use something like this one? So that looks like what you have. Yeah, that's, that's the one I think that Ryan has. Okay. or that I have in my possession right now. Yeah. It's kind of funny because the enter key is kind of like the letters are kind of worn off. Like this one. Yeah, like that one. <laughs> <as a matter fact. laughs> I don't think we have a bottom picture of this one. No, unfortunately not. Well, what I can do is I can uh, take a tape off, not now, but I'll do it maybe in this week and I'll take a picture of the bottom. Okay, cool. Yeah. Hey, Joe. There we go. Yeah, uh, many years ago, I had a, it was just a piece of rubber with little dents in it, a little round concave uh, dents in a flat piece of clear rubbery material that just basically stuck on top of the keyboard. And yeah. it, you get your fingers right on where they needed to be. They weren't actually keys. It was kind of the opposite of a key. But yeah, it was a, it was like a, a sort of an overlay and with sort of circular spots yes where you, your fingers would sort of fit in right yeah help you center yeah and it would help uh that helped a lot with uh with and, and was that homemade or you bought that no i bought that huh. that was uh advertised in syntax magazine yeah like every issue <laughs> advertisement <laughs> yeah there were a couple of devices like that there was a, a kd made one um i don't remember the name of the one that you're talking about uh, but there was, you know, there were a bunch of weird little, you know, adaptation devices, uh, like, uh, you know, like what you, you're using Adam and what you had, yeah. Joe, that just would, you know, make well, it makes a little bit easier. sense because they're like, there's, it was an inexpensive computer. And if someone could sell something with that, that didn't cost too much, that would uh, give a little better quality of life, then, you know, why not pick it up? Yeah. Well, and I did a, I ran, um, Dan Ross uh, uh, did a presentation at the Boston Computer Society to sort of announce the 20, uh, the 2068 and the 1500, and that's up on YouTube. And I downloaded the transcript, or did I, I think actually there's no transcript. I ran it through a piece of software that does transcripts. And um, that's one of the things he talked about, you know, when they launched the 2068 was, uh, you know, this huge cottage industry sprang up around the 1000. They, you know, recognized what, you know, what value that was, how important that was to, you know, 
the you know the sustainability of of the 1000 and they wanted to encourage that with the two, with the 2068 so you know they they said it was going to be an open computer and you could you know get specs to, to add on stuff and and whatever um and certainly you know programmers were were given this sort of preliminary third party software programmers guide uh for adapting you know writing new programs or adapting spectrum programs to the 2068 um unfortunately they did not last <laughs> but they were open for six months <laughs> or less. Well, if we don't really have an agenda maybe uh could i ask other people like some small uses of uh like maybe add-ons that you bought for your computer besides ram packs i guess that were maybe unusual that you used that maybe other people didn't have too much access to yeah i'd love to hear about that not everyone all at once right right <laughs> Well, oh, oh, Carl, wait, look, but is Carl ready? Remember, Carl was going to, you asked Carl about his, Carl's ready. All right, so so let's, we'll let Carl do his thing and um, everybody line up with your, with your, uh, your stories of, of accessories. Yeah, well, I'm still kind of fighting a cold, so that's kind of why I, I, I haven't really messed with it too much, but, um, uh, but, you know, I kind of got into a, uh, you know, a whirlwind of doing that so i've got the um i wonder where Stuart is i haven't seen Stuart lately so i, I hope he got back from costa rica okay i hope he didn't oh. get like uh kidnapped or something <laughs> you know what they're doing there Wait <laughs> anyway the right side carl well you know um anyway so i have his uh that the zx8 ccb that uh uh you know he sent me a few of those for you know so we could get adam going and, and ryan going and uh, so I tried one of those in Ryan's third and last uh, TS-1000. And um, in addition to that, I had posted some pictures of, you know, and I think I mentioned it last meeting where I picked up some, uh, you know, the, the 555 timer um, composite mod, right? Mm -hmm. Now that doesn't have any type of adjustments on it, which is probably in hindsight, not necessarily a good thing. You probably should have some adjustments on any of these things, just just in case, right? <laughs> and so, um, uh, and to make a long story short, you know, I hooked both of them up. Um, and so I could individually, you know, hook up each one and see what looked good. And uh, neither of them looked good. <laughs> um, even, you know, now that I've done two of those, one in Ryan's and one in Adam's, um, Adams obviously was to me the easiest one because I think he probably because he's got the latest ULA, he's got the 210 ULA in there, which mm. has the back porch on it already, and it's newer probably. And that machine didn't look like it was used that much, so it's probably it's probably a pretty fresh ULA, right? Um, I'm starting to maybe le lean towards some credence what, what Claudius was talking about that uh, you know he saw some of that interference that. Re um, Ryan showed on the, the last meeting and he was saying that was a, the ULA was going bad, right? He was kind of mentioning that. And I was like, hmm, that could be uh, maybe what's going on. But um, this one seems to be the worst out of all of the ones I've done, right? This, so I'm thinking maybe this ULA is the worst. It's probably the most far gone. Maybe it's been used the most. Um, but well, well either... Carl, are you getting a picture at all? Yeah, I can get a picture, but it's um, like I said with the with the one that Stuart sent me, the ZX8 CCB. I can get it, but the the cursor's all, you know, like the upper portion of it's kind of offset, right? It's oh. not a nice square K smearing, right? It's starting to smear on the top, and I can't really get that tuned out, no matter what I do. So then I said, okay, well, I'll try the 555 timer one. And that one was even worse. I mean, that had a crappier picture, right? And that, since I can't adjust anything on that one, well, there you have it. That's what you get. <laughs> <laughs> and then, um, so I said, well, maybe if I take the output of one and put it into the other one and see, maybe that'll help something. So I kind of started to cascade them. You know, I took the output of the ZX8 CCB and put it into the 555 timer one. And uh, well, that, suffice it to say, that doesn't work either, no matter which way you put it. That sounds like the Bride of Frankenstein, but the Bride of Composite Out or something. Exactly. Right, right. <laughs> well, I figured, you know, if I could get the CCB to work decently, maybe the 555 timer would, you know, kind of help 
boost it up and fix it, but it didn't work that way. Uh, then I said, well, hell with it. I'm going to take the Yole out and I'm going to pull, put one of my VLA 88, 81s in there, right? That I got, I bought two of those. And I think, I don't know, maybe I did something wrong. I don't know what though, but I think I blew one of the gates on the ZX8 CCB composite mod because it gets pretty toasty. The one, <laughs> the one little gate. Um, maybe it's because the VL, I'm thinking maybe the VLA 81. When I initially put it in, both of the dip switches were off. So that basically puts out a very high level. Supposedly, you can hook it right to a composite monitor with those with those switches off, right? And so it must have put out a pretty high level video signal. Um, and maybe that blew that gate out as I'm kind of what I'm thinking. But anyway, I'll have to either use another one or I'll have to get, a, you know, buy a, one little gate and, and desolder it and resolder it on there. I'd rather do that than didn't waste a whole, you know, composite mod. But um, uh, in any case, uh, so now on the VLA81, you have two dip switches that control video stuff. Uh, the first dip switch, dip switch one, basically is the level, right? So if it's off, it's a high level, which is what I initially, you know, plugged it in and hooked everything up as. If you turn it on, then it's more like uh, what the ULA would put out. So if you wanted to use a composite mod or you wanted to use the existing video circuitry that was already there, that's the setting that you should leave it on, right? You need to turn switch one on. I tried that and still um, uh, wasn't really getting very good pictures out of the composite mods, you know, nothing that I would consider, you know, passable. Uh, so now let's get to switch two. So switch two basically is the back porch on or off. So this tells it basically to either emulate an older ULA, like the 158 or the 174, right? Or if you turn it on, it uh, puts the back porch on it. So basically it emulates like the ULA that's in, in Ryan or in, in um, Adam's machine, the 210, hmm. right? So if both switches are on, then you have basically a ULA 210 emulation, right? If you leave switch one on and switch two off, well, then you're emulating an older ULA with no back porch. So if well, you have- Carl, I have a question. Like uh -huh. if, you, if you are trying to, with that in there and you're just going out RF, do you have a picture? No, it oh, looks crappy oh. too, yeah. Oh, now well, I have to say this, I have to say this. I have the best RF TV output with the VLA81 in there than anything. You, oh. you, it's, it's, it's very usable on the, on the TV. I have it hooked up to like, I got to take a picture, but it's like a 27 inch TV that I kind of use to hook these things up to. And, um, and this is a modern TV or an old CRT? It's an old TV. It's oh. the one that I, I kind of said that uh, a lot of these things I'll get from the auction here from Bentley's local. We have a local yeah. auction here. They, they uh, sell a lot of, you know, we got government here, right? I mean, a lot of places probably have government, but they sell a lot of government stuff. And I think I got this TV from like a school. Uh, like a school must have went out of, you know, because it was on a cart, like an AV cart, you know, like mm -hmm. the schools have, and it was bolted down or maybe it wasn't one of them. But anyway, I get a lot of TVs from them because they're cheap. I mean, nobody buys them. They're like a dollar, right? Now you just got to go get it and cart this big old cart home. And now this TV <laughs> in particular, <laughs> yeah, this TV in particular is a Philips, but it was obviously, I think it came out of a hotel kind of environment because it, it was locked down. What I mean locked down is, you know, you can't change channels, you turn it on, you can only do like volume up and down. You can't change the channel, you know, it was locked. Yeah. You know, they make a remote that I bought that I basically unlocked it, right? I made all the features available again. So now I can change channels, I can, uh, you know, do stuff like that. But there's a lot more features in there that you don't get on a regular TV set, hey, Carl. right? That you can lock down, yeah. Gustavo has a question for you. Oh, okay, yeah, sorry about that. Go ahead, <laughs> Gustavo. Hi, hello. No, it's uh, for the group too. Uh, do you know if exists any documentation regarding the Timex uh, timing, regarding the, for example, how many clock cycles has between the interrupt and, and, and the vertical and horizontal pulse and all the scanning? Uh, um, I, I, I think, I don't think there's anything per se from Timex, right? Because it's all, you know, the 1000 is basically based on the ZX81, right? So, yeah. and the ZX81 was already designed from the get-go to obviously work on 50 or 60 hertz because it has that, uh, it has that pin, right? That that you either ground 
or you leave open, which tells it uh, to go 50 cycles or 60 cycles. So if you actually leave it open and you go to 50 cycles, um, you know, the, the, the TS-1000 is a lot faster. Yes. No, but right. in this case, the, the CX81 use uh, the creation by software. Uh, you receive an interrupt and then the C80 move the data to the to the serial shifter. That yeah. is by, by software, create mm -hmm. the, the video. But my, my question was uh, focus on the Timex, the 2068. Because oh. I, I have the, the, the timing, but get for the scope in my house. Uh, my question is, is exist any official or any another uh, source for these uh, specific values? Well, I have seen some stuff on the video in the, you know, the Timex technical manual. Yeah. yeah. You know, they do talk about timings and stuff like that of the video signal in there. I don't know if it's specifically what you're looking for, but that would probably be the best place, I think, hmm. to look for something like that for the 2068. No, yes, no, no, I need more deeper in design because I try to 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 get the, the full, full documentation for the SCLD. I have the counters, I have the scanning, counters and also the timing is correct for 60 hertz is different for the 50 hertz version mm -hmm. the, the, mm -hmm. the count is different and i have documented all the information but only to be sure that the the information i collect for my time max is correct that is only to match uh, my data with the another person or another document mm. that was well you know you might want to you might want to cross reference it with the, right. the the PAL 2068 right the one that's in the portugal computers because that one that one does have a pin on it as well right for 50 or 60 hertz they're huh. they're the same chip yeah and you could you could buy the 2060 paul i think paul holmgren probably has one or two of the of the portuguese 2068 and you know you I could have one them. of that you could buy them um, from English Micro Connection and a couple other folks in the United States in '85 ish. Um, so yeah, there's you know there's some here and they were and 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 Joao from the Low CX um, Museum has talked about how uh, Tony uh, Gomez from the the Portuguese Timex came to the United States with the aim of trying to get FCC certification for that uh, Portuguese Timex. Uh, didn't, mm -hmm. Nothing ever came of that, you know. I know I, I see one new name here that I recognize as new and that's Michael. Michael, I'm, a, I'm not gonna even try to butcher your last name. Are you, but I'm gonna ask you to unmute and say hi, <laughs> if you don't mind. <laughs> Last name is Druckenmiller. Druckenmiller. Okay. You got it first try. <laughs> All right. Sounds German. Druck. Uh, Pennsylvania Deutsch. Oh, uh, yeah. Oh, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. uh, yeah. I am, uh, I don't know if I'm the oldest guy here. Uh, probably not. I'm 70. Uh, joined the Navy at 17, but I got 42 weeks of uh, aviation electronics technician training in Millington, Tennessee, uh, served my sex, got out, worked a myriad of jobs, uh, learned to program in uh, Visual Basic when I was at Intel so that I wouldn't transpose numbers I reported to my engineer. Uh, it was so much easier for the computer to gather data using the PIB. Uh, I got let me, like, let me ask you real quick, how did you get into the Timex computers? Uh, I had always had an interest of, of microprocessing. And uh, of course, nothing that I was interested in was within my price range. <laughs> and uh, I had looked at the trash 80 uh, later and even the uh, Heath H89, 
which I actually owned one of those, but I couldn't do anything with it uh, unless I wanted to buy expensive software. But the, uh, like a previous friend on the community said, uh, I think it was J.C. Penny for me as well. <laughs> uh, I walked in and they had a whole stack half price, which was ninety nine dollars, and uh, bought one for me and one for my grandfather, who at that time was then was my age now. <laughs> and uh, he actually uh, he actually wrote a little anim animation program, and it, it really astounded me that uh, he. He was able to do that. Um, of course, he was the one that got me into electronics uh, as a teen. Uh, showed me ways of troubleshooting that uh, broke all the rules but produced results. Um, you know, they were asking about uh, interfaces that people couldn't get a hold of. Well, mm -hmm. Here's one. What's the deal with that? <laughs> uh, this was one of my forays into insanity. Was I bought a surplus Selectric I/O console, and I programmed my Timex 2068 to talk to it. Basically, I. Uh, and I'm still trying to figure out how I did this. <laughs> uh, it's it's not easy when you you know you've had three heart attacks and a couple of microstrokes. There are holes in my mind. I think that comes from Babylon Five or something. Uh, but basically, for this one, there was a translation table that translated the ASCII characters into the solenoids so that it hit the right solenoids to do the rotate and tilt. Uh, oh. And in order to get my... Uh, oh my gosh. In order to get my uh, bus connectors, uh, I salvaged the, these. I got two of these back planes out of the trash when I worked for Burroughs. <laughs> they just happened to be the right connector pitch. Uh, <laughs> You know, it's, it's kind of like I, I served six years in the Navy as, as an aviation electronics technician. And uh, if I could make my job easier writing a program in Quick Basic or DBase 3 Plus or Visual Basic or Python and now C Sharp, I would because I'm lazy. And <laughs> You know, uh, I had an abiding, uh, yeah, binding, yeah, it was binding me. I had an abiding love for uh, high level math like the FFT, the Fourier transform, but my brain could never wrap itself around it. And uh, so, needless to say, becoming an electronics engineer was far past my, my uh, ken. But when I went to calibration or metrology school, uh, I was able to go up to Boulder, Colorado at National Bureau of Standards, and they gave me a, a um, printout from a guy, Wagoner, for, for the FFT, and I was able to get it converted from whatever basic he was using to uh, Timex basic. And you Granted, it's really slow <laughs> because it's interpreted basic. But uh, and and you uh, you have a website that you put that on. Yeah, the uh, I have I, I do have a website uh, which originally was because all my life I wanted to be a preacher, <laughs> but uh, the uh, powers that be did not like my inability to play their games. Uh, but yes, uh, www.houseofmer.org, and it's uh, H O U S E O F M Y R R H. 
and mm -hmm. there's a little link at the bottom called programming and there's different little things there that uh, most of which I've written in, in uh, uh, yeah, I can put the J, I can put that in the website you know, on the chat. Cool. Uh, uh, once, what, I get, what, what? once I get kicked off of here because I'm too long winded. <laughs> <laughs> Well, one thing, Michael, I noticed behind you there, over your shoulder, that that looks like a, a some kind of timeless computer. Is that right? Yes, there is a. Because uh, it's not silver, so that must be a Portugal machine. No, it, it is silver. It's. Oh, it's, okay. It's just the camera. Wrong okay. angle. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's it's been gathering a lot of dust because my Timex aspirations uh, sat in a box in a dusty place for say 30 years <laughs> which also accounts for some of my uh, inability to remember things well what what uh, made you dig it out and uh, bring it back and join i don't know a facebook group or join us um, i've always been interested in figuring out what i can do with the z80 the z80 is my preferred microprocessor uh, at Intel, we use 8032s. Uh, at Dixie Narco, we use 6809s. Uh, fortunately, I was on the hardware side and I didn't have to make all those changes. But the Timex Sinclair was the first Z80 machine I had. And I wanted to, I wanted to dig down in the guts and find out ways of expanding it. Now, I couldn't, at the time, I had neither the time nor the money spared out to do much of anything. So life got in the way, and uh, I just didn't go any further with it. So now I'm, I'm fully retired and fully bored, and I've got to find something to do or I'll go start <laughs> raving mad. So uh, the other side of the coin is there's there's another group called called the RC2014, which is also a Z80. Yeah. And they have been doing all kinds of things uh, that I want to find out enough about to transfer them to the Timex community because it's a little more of a all-in-one than the RC2014, which is mostly a terminal computer and the Timex up, I've got actual video and a keyboard standalone. Yeah. So, but yeah, I, uh, I, I tend to write and solve my own problems because most people don't think or talk or communicate like I do. And so I've written my own disassembler, my own assembler, uh, so that I understand it in terms that my brain can handle it. So that's really cool, Michael. Thank you. Uh, oh, no, Jay. Sure. Jay wanted that uh, website. If you could maybe to throw that in the chat, so I guess it would be easier for folks to. Yeah. To get to. You know, some some of you guys can chew gum and walk at the same time. <laughs> well, you know, the same is true about talking and typing. Um, may I right. add something? Yeah, go ahead, Paul. Back in 87, when we had the show, one of the gentlemen that was showing his 2068 with 256K of memory worked on the initial avionics for the F-16. Was that um, uh -oh. Peterson? Uh, uh, William Peterson. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I mispronounced his name. Very cool. Yeah, that, that was uh, something I did while I was working at uh, Raytheon in Orangeburg. Uh, they built the modules for the radar on the F-15. And my job was to put them on the uh, tester and uh, verify that the girls doing all the soldering didn't have any solder bridges. <laughs> cool. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Hey, so Jay, I, uh, not Jay, Joe, I saw you raise your hand. 
when Adam um, uh, asked about accessories. My favorite accessory of all time. <gasps> oh my god! It's, oh my god! What is it? It is a <laughs> it is a bite back, uh, eight bit IO. So you could do input and output from your TS one thousand, and actually control things in the real world. These are relays that uh, you can use to control uh, whatever you want to put on them. I, I I did a Christmas tree light display. Yeah. way back in the day uh <laughs> so that you, you know you could turn on and off eight different strings because th this this actually went to a uh another relay board which had larger relays on it so i could string together a bunch of different strings at once but it was eight, eight different sections could light up and shut off based on a program and uh i wish i still had that program but that's one of the things that got lost in a, a basement flood years mm. ago I had, I had a whole box of printouts and tapes and uh, my ta original tape deck was all <laughs> was all ruined mm. flood. but I, this this was this was in a box that was on a higher shelf so this got saved and i also had the uh associated analog, i was going to ask yeah the analog input but i don't have the documentation for this anymore so I don't remember how to use it. <laughs> and I have not been able to find the documentation for that, but you could, uh, you could plug an analog signal in there and uh, this plugged into the top and it would be an A to D converter. And then you could get readings of that analog signal, uh, you know, digitally, yeah. digital number representation, but you had, programming i don't know if you can see that but you have programming resistors in the back to set oh, the yeah. levels and uh some jumpers up front and some dip switches so yeah there was quite a bit to setting it up and i, I don't have that information anymore so i don't remember how to use this david you don't dis you'll disappoint me if you don't have it on your website come on i don't have the main oh. but i know exactly what both of those things are okay. so so Biteback was one of the first companies to make accessories, and that relay module was their first module. And then the the hunter board, oh, nobody yeah. could live without the hunter board. You could swap in either ROM or RAM in here, and it sat between the eight and sixteen K section, and uh, it's battery backed up, so you could shut your computer off, and the static RAM would remember your program. So that that's that's what I use. In conjunction with with the uh, oh, uh, to save your program. Yeah, thing. So I could put the program in here, uh, and then when I wanted to run it, I would just run a really short uh, program to move it from here up into the regular memory, and then then run it. I would love that documentation. <laughs> <laughs> Well, there might be something on the bite back that that IO board. Is there David? Some is there a schematic of that? I, I think I have the IO board information. Yeah. But I think that's already been um uh yeah, I'm sure uh, that's probably already out archived. there. Archived. But yep. it was the A to D converter. It, the, uh, yeah, that A to D converter is a is a piece of mystery meat, as it were. Yeah. And then this is the uh um Gladstone. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Gladstone Electronics keyboard and case, you know, it's all nice little metal project case. That was Did you one have of my to put that together hammer. yourself? Um, more or less, yeah, yeah, Looks it was, like it. yeah. But the all the keycaps are plastic, clear plastic, so you can pop them off and put new labels. New in. And this yeah. is from back in the eighties, or this is yeah, yeah that's, like, that's, oh, that's wow, yeah, that's yeah. pretty good. So that's actually. Yeah, Glad that was imported from England. Uh, there was a company called Dean Electronics that made those, and, and Gladstone brought them over. Yeah. Yeah. yeah well, was... I expect you're going to type in a basic program and archive it for David. You've got that keyboard. <laughs> <laughs> well, and in theory, you could, you could, you know, hook up those extra keys that are unused on on Joe's and make them do other things. Yeah, I have. Uh... 
Well, that that other monstrosity that I showed you that was made out of a yeah uh, the 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 destroyed TI ninety nine that one had the little circuits. I added those to add the extra keys so that I had real arrow keys that were just arrow keys. <laughs> that's that's my favorite. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um. Hey Tim. Uh, Swenson. I'm gonna ask you to. I'll ask you to unmute. Uh, Paul Holmgren told me, Paul, a couple of weeks ago that you have, Paul has everything that was left over from, was it Syncware News, Paul? Yes. Yeah. Uh, all these unpublished articles. And um, one, of the, one of these days, Paul's going to send it to me. And what I'm going to do is try to track down the folks and ask them if we can publish them in Tim's newsletter, ZX Zine, because Tim's the only person still publishing a newsletter. <laughs> so we'll give you some material. Oh, Tim's not there. We'll give Tim. So we'll give Tim some material one of these days. <laughs> well, yeah, that reminds me. Um, go ahead. All that's left to do is get the exact weight. And I did some preliminary looking. Mm -hmm. and you can classify that as uh, computer material or media. Yeah. It might be the cheapest way to ship it. Yeah, ship it media mail. Yeah, which is what, um, which is what Bob was, was saying earlier about sending stuff to Hawaii. If you ship it media mail, it's the least it's expensive. About, it's about 25 pounds, but the, yeah. anything over, you know, you can go a tenth of a pound over and they nick you. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. for the next one as long as it's all pretty much paper because i know i know i've bought stuff from ebay and people have used media mail to send like computers and shit so i mean if the post office opens it up and says hey this is this isn't, this isn't media they'll they'll you know probably screw you there but uh yeah I'm, I'm just saying people have taken advantage of that and i i don't know how how bad they're cracking down on it well at least in this case there is a lot of paper Okay, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> so we we have you know uh, what thirty year old articles to look forward to. <laughs> well, you really have when, to get there. Go ahead. When Basil Wentworth closed shop, it, yeah, you know, a lot of that stuff ended up here. That's hilarious. I was going to say, do you really have to get their permission to publish that, or? No, no, but I think it'll be part of the part of the amusement value of true. You know, okay, I can track the folks okay. down, and and then we can get some extra, uh, you know, extra information from those those authors about their their setups, and you know, I think that'll be amusing to to have. True, true. <laughs> um, and, you know, I just uh, thought of something. Um, I actually am wearing my Timex T-shirt. Uh, I'm going to stand up and show it real quick because <laughs> I don't think I had it last time. But oh, nice! This is the Look one, at that. Yeah, yeah, this is the one that David designed. Um, well, I don't know. I got it. I think I might have had it the, before the meeting, but I didn't wear it. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. I can't remember who who asked for that design. If, was that maybe Ryan that liked that design? Or was yeah, I think so. Yeah. Okay. Okay. It was Ryan. So, uh, well, it's good to see some people buying that stuff. That's good. And <laughs> I know it was kind of nice to, you know, to have some merch because I know you know seems like every other little cause has merch, right? So. I do what I can for you. <laughs> <laughs> so, did anybody else have um, you know accessories that they bought for their uh, their computers back in the day that they want to talk about, or any other subjects folks want to talk about? Well, there's something I would like to talk about since I'm type. I don't want to talk about it myself, but I would like other people to t talk about it. So I'm typing in um, a program, which I've mentioned already this time and the last few times I've said I'm going to, at least this time I started. Um, I, I'm curious how many people here um, maybe typed in basic programs back in the 80s and um, in two different ways. I wonder like if they typed them in knowing basic and so they mm -hmm. typed them in out of magazines or they just blindly believed that what they were typing in was going to work and hopefully they didn't make any errors. Uh, those are my two questions, <laughs> because if you didn't know basic at all and you were just typing in a program, I don't know how, how well it would work out for you because you wouldn't know like you were mistyping something really, you know. Anybody? It, Abba. Tell us your story. You're going to have to unmute, though. Oh. 
You are muted, Ada. There you go. Okay. There you go. Oh, I unmuted. Uh, oh, now, now Tim puts his hand up. <laughs> <laughs> well, You're next, Tim. <laughs> I, I have never been a programmer, and I'm not a programmer. But when I bought the ZX81, I wrote basic programming because it is a self-syntax checking. You couldn't enter an erroneous line. The line had to be correct for the basic interpreter to accept. Yeah, yeah, it was difficult. Yeah, it, but you got used to it. So that's my two cents. So do you mean you uh, were typing in programs from magazines and such? No. No. Oh, you were writing your own programs then? Yeah, it, it was a calculus program. I spent probably close to two years uh, my spare time. Wow. You know, both basic and I learned some modules of machine code. So I stuck that machine code in between the basic. This was 1984, 85-ish. Wow. And they, they are now all in my garage. And the garage once flooded, and I don't know how much damage happened. So once I got to my garage, I'm looking for a good home for both the 2068 and TS-1000 and all kinds of printer modern paraphernalia I have. <laughs> and I know not to take away from Tim, you know, Tim's got a question, but I just wanted to say, you know, when I was in high school and learning programming and everything, you know, a lot of times I didn't have the machine there with me, right? So I would be writing, I would be writing programs, something that I wanted to do, I would be coding it right in, in a notebook. On a paper, yeah. Right. And then when I got home to actually to the computer, then I would actually start entering it then so that's something else maybe a lot of people did because a lot of times you know you didn't you didn't have the computer there yeah. you know but you had an idea and it was like well you didn't want that to go away so you kind of you know started coding based on that idea and you know you took it home and and made see if the proof you know met the pudding so to speak <laughs> and, and tim you did a little bit just a tiny bit well, um, so when the ZX81 first came out in the U.S., and I got mine in November of 81, there were no magazines with type-ins. There was no English ma English magazines to get. Mm. So the only thing I could find was David All's uh, basic programs book, you know, oh and then the more basic programs. And those are all teletype type programs. So I had to learn how to translate from that to Sinclair Basic, and then if I wanted to, how to add graphics. Yeah. So it wasn't just a straight type in and it's going to work the first time. It was a read it, interpret it, type it in, give it a try, and then kind of play with it a bit to see how it worked. Well, and, and Tim, those were all written in like DEC or HP Basic, which had things like, you know, left and right and midstream. Mid -string, yep. Yeah. And you had to translate that to the, you know, to the Sinclair way. Yep. You know, and I that was challenging. Doing, doing a course in college where it was, basic and i had my 1000 they were talking something else and they wanted to do data statements i'm like don't do data <laughs> statements right. so i did string slicing so okay i don't have data statement but if i type in this long string and then slice it up i get the equivalent of data string of a data yeah. statement and the guy's like okay yeah i mean <laughs> you, you want to put the effort in you had to be really creative and but it, yeah. you know, it, it lets you do some cool stuff and then you went and wrote a, pro a program and sold it. That, did you, what, you sell a few copies? One or two, something like that. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's one or two more than many of us did, I will say. I'll buy, it. I'll, I'll buy through, a copy. <laughs> I did go through the process of filing for a fictitious business statement, filing for a local business license, that whole process, a home business license from the city of Fremont. Uh, all that sort of stuff. So I was I was officially legit. I went and got a tax license from the state board, the whole bit. That's cool. That's really cool. And you, you dug up a little bit, uh, something about it, like a printout or a screen capture or something. 
Yeah, I found uh, one screen capture from a print I did. It was in an a old photo album I ran across. I think you've got some. Um, the, I some created a page one. for you because you were a yep. business, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yep, MTD software stood for Mike, Tim, and Doug. Yeah. Very cool. Very cool. And I'm still in contact with both of them. I'm, I am actually see one of them next month. And do, yeah, next month sometime. You, you guys should restart the business and, and start programming yeah. for this. <laughs> it wouldn't be hard hey. to double your sales. Exactly. Yeah, it wouldn't be hard. Yeah. You, you have a captive audience here, Tim. <laughs> I think I wanted them to join me, but they never did. So uh, one never guy had a Coco, one guy had a Vic 20, and I had the 1000 or the Zig City one. So yeah. we had a variety. That's awesome. Cheers. Yes. AJ, tell us your tale. Um, I, I have a whole bunch of peripherals for the 1000 and the 2068. Um, I, I don't know if I've mentioned it before. I've gotten the whole memo, memo tech, uh, series. Uh, add-on. Yeah. Series. I had the, um, 64 K Ram. Um, I had the serial interface, the Centronics interface. I have the, uh, HRG. Mm -hmm. I have the keyboard. Uh, and is it is it the blue keyboard or the black keyboard? Yeah, it's a blue one. The blue one. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, aqua aqua blue over there. And uh, I think the letter W went uh, out. I like to. <laughs> fit, I, I would like to get that fixed. But anyways, um, I, I've got the ZX printer. Um, I uh, what else did I get? I got the bite back um, uh, real time clock that that you can put on both the one thousand and the twenty sixty eight. I I had run a uh, the uh, CAS board from Kurt Casby uh, with the 2068. So I used a uh, real time time clock to timestamp uh, things on the 2040 printer when people called in. Oh, wow. wow. Yeah, I, I added a little code there. Um, I took a pie chart program for the 1000 and adapted it for the HRG graphics. Um, I, I had to put it into fast mode when it drew the stuff because uh, otherwise you'd be sitting there forever. Um, I thought that that was nice, but the thing is the, the, the pixels for the screen and the pixels for the printer are uh, different sizing. I had more of an oval on the printer, mm -hmm. but it, it was rounded for the uh, TV screen. Yeah. Very so, uh, on the on the 2068, I I bought all of John McMichael's uh, software there. I had the 1520 printer interface. I had Koala Pad. Um, I have the FDD 3000. So, uh, Jay, let's you just you just I, mentioned I, I something just, that a lot of folks probably don't know about. And so John McMichael um, figured out how to uh, interface the Commodore 1520 pen plotter which is this little printer then it printed on paper that was about uh well the the radio four. shack had a printer just like that exactly. with the pen. Yeah, it was it was i had both of them and the yeah. atari too yeah and the atari i used to have the atari one for my yeah atari. a lot of a lot of companies did that because they all use the alps mechanism, alps mechanism. yeah yeah <laughs> so but but the commodore you know serial was pretty easy to figure out and so what what uh, john did was uh hooked it up he i think he actually built a little you know uh interface board yeah and, i have that uh, and and then he wrote software you know that you could use to 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 print from it um <clears throat> which is kind of cool and then the next thing that he did was uh the same thing but for the okimate 10 and okimate right, i i i had printers i have those i i have the uh, i had the i think i got the 10 and i got the 20 it was a nice improvement with the 20 yeah. but the problem now is you can't get you know the proper paper for or for the, the ribbons for for the ribbons you know oh. it's a wax type thing yeah it's a very unique kind of uh, printing mechanism it was really oh cool. yeah it would it would be nice to get i remember printing off from that and they, you had some nice gr uh, graphics but if you don't have the right paper it it looks like kind of faded out with with yeah. the proper paper uh that that grabbed the the, the you had to get that uh, really really slick the wax. smooth thermal paper yeah Mm -hmm. yeah you, i i don't know where you can get it now i think you just can't no you can't um also i had the the uh larkin disc for the 1000 oh cool yeah 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 Crazy. and 
I've never used it. I never hooked it up. I want to. <laughs> Hook it up on the show live and we'll help you step through it. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, we have about 15 minutes it, left and, and I see we have a late joiner. Sure. Claudio? Let me mute. Claudio, are you there? Yes, yes, I am. <laughs> it's nice to, to, to meet you. Yeah, say hi. Tell us a little bit about yourself and tell us, uh, you know, I, I see you have a micro digital behind you. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> I'm a Brazilian guy, in fact. And I still have this little guy here. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Claudia, where what is that? Where are you? And we'll, we'll, Yeah, we'll get to the what is that in a second. But where are you, Claudia? Claudio? I am in Brazil. Brazil. Okay. Yes. And MicroDigital was a company in Brazil that made clones. Spectrum clones. So a lot of clones, in fact. It cloned uh, Apple II systems, uh, ZX, ZX Spectrum systems, and, and well, it was what we had at the time. We mm -hmm. didn't have uh, access to, to, to Commodore 64 or anything else because uh, the legislation uh, prevented us from importing computers at the time. So, well, it, 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 it ended up happening something similar to that what happened in Russia. Uh, so we developed or cloned computers here. And it was my first computer. In fact, it, it already is. It still is. <laughs> I still have it. <laughs> and oh boy, I had quite a lot of fun with it. <laughs> uh, Claudio? Yes? Hi, my name is Gustavo. I live in Buenos Aires, Argentina. We are very close and also. ¿Qué tal? Ah, bien. <laughs> uh, and the idea is uh, in Argentina, we use many, many computers like the micro, micro digital. And also, I remember uh, two or three models more than that you have. Uh, all are compatible with the Spectrum or was a different operating system? Well, we had uh, TK82C. That was ZX81. Uh, TK85, that was uh, ZX, ZX81 also. We had the TK90X and we had the TK95 that were both spectrum, 40, 40, 48 kilobytes. Okay. The okay. ZX, uh, the, the, the TK90s. X uh, had two versions, one with 16 kilobytes and one another one with 48 kilobytes. Yeah. Did right. you guys have uh, the, uh, I think it was the CP400? Was that a microphone? Yeah, it, it was a, a TRS uh, color clone, yes. But but the, but the it, it was not about it. micro digital, it was from ProLogica. Pro ProLogica, okay. And the, and the unique thing about it was it, well, like what you said, it was a uh, a Tandy color computer clone, but the case looked like the 2068, the Timex 2068. Yes, yes, it's very it, bizarre. It, uh, <laughs> the, the, the TK95 uh, is a Commodore keyboard. Oh, is it really? <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, yes. <laughs> uh, let me see if I can it's, find Here we go. CP it was gorgeous. It was a fantastic machine. Uh, the 95 was a was a Commodore keyboard. Or was it a bread bin case that they just put a Spectrum into, or what? No, uh, it, it was not exactly a Commodore. I, I believe it was. A, a, I'm trying to remember the, the, the correct Commodore model here, but uh, I, maybe it was a, maybe it was a 16. It wasn't a 64, but maybe one of the later ones, a 16, maybe. No, no, it it, it was the the, the 64. Oh, the uh, one hundred. It's the uh, um, shoot. I recognize this. Plus I'm four? Put it up on the screen. You, you'll recognize it in a second. Um, oh, crud. I gotta get the right plus right four? Out. Sorry. Commodore plus, plus four. four, maybe? Yes, or the 16. Uh, yes, 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 yes. Uh, plus four. Recognize that? Um, yeah. Yeah, so that's the plus four, yeah. Yeah, yeah, but that's America, no, but that's yeah. that's the, you know, the TK95. Oh, it is. Yes. Yeah. Yes. That's awesome. See, it says Micro Digital TK ninety five, and they took <laughs> you know they took the plus four case and keyboard and did their thing, and then the ProLogica 
Does that look familiar? Yeah. How did this never yes, come yes. up before? <laughs> <laughs> well, That's but awesome. the innards are a color computer. You know, they're they're not well, a you can't have everything. Yeah, here's yeah, a here's a ProLogica with a nicer radio keyboard. Radio Isn't that crazy? Wow. Quite, do people um, collect all these things or how many of them are there i mean yes and, and we collect not only uh, uh the next pack on apple twos but all uh also msx uh yeah. you know, i don't believe this is this platform is quite common in in in, in the united states but it was quite oh uh, yeah let me see just What's a second just yeah a yeah yeah, the closest yeah, we had to the MSX here is the ColecoVision, Adam, right? I think. No, the Spectre video. Remember the Spectre oh, video? Yes, that was here. true MSX. Yeah. I don't. Oh, let me deactivate the 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 yeah. The yeah, right. filter. <laughs> uh, just a sec. A classic problem. <laughs> oh my! Where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Yeah, the, the MSX was really popular in Japan and and Europe, and interestingly enough, in um. You know, in Arab countries, oh. there's a lot of of, of uh, MSX computers with Arab keyboards. Oh, that's a hot. You got to focus on them because it it's oh, just sorry. you, David. Okay, <laughs> I'm sorry. It's a hot git. There you go. Can you see it? Yeah, yeah. That so looks like that an MSX. Was that a Sony Hitbit? Because that kind was of, released yeah. here. Hot bit. Hot there bit. was a, a Japanese computer that was called. Hit bit, but it's not a hit bit. It's a hot bit. <laughs> you know, because That's it's a warmer happens. country. It's a hot yeah. bit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> South America is, is way hotter. <laughs> so, Claudio, oh, how did you find us? How did I find it? How, how did you find how did us? You find us? How did you find the group? Well... <clears throat> In fact, uh, how can I say? I, I believe some of us, if not all of us, stay in the with the 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 the, the mental disposition of a fourteen years old guy. So, <laughs> <laughs> everything that I, I learned, uh, love it at the time. I still love today. So, well, I. <laughs> was looking for people like me, mm -hmm. people who like to. In fact, I still write code today for retro platforms. Mm. And I have some some different solutions here, like this one. Oh, what is that? Ah, this is a, an FPGA-based computer. Oh, nifty. David's yes. going to build one. It's... No, no, no. I'm... Uh... <laughs> I got plenty of those. <laughs> It is the 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 MSX cartridge expansion. Oh, but I already have here the ZX Next expansion. I, I love how he has everything within reach. <laughs> That's Earl, why he's not showing. Earl, his you room. should take notes. <laughs> yeah, everything within reach. <laughs> because of you, then daily. <laughs> Oh. oh my, where is that? Well, the well, ZX Next expansion, huh? What, what, what is that's that? That's what I'm waiting to see. I yeah, want I'm to very see curious. what that is. Well, people can't even get the Next. I want to see what the expansion is. Yes, in fact, it, 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 it uh, just, this specific hardware was made by Victor Truco, okay. who was the guy that created the TB Blue yeah. project that evolved into the the ZX Spectrum next. So I have the 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 the, the guys phone. So <laughs> and isn't isn't Victor uh from South America? Yes, he is from Rio de Janeiro. No, Niterói. I, I believe the the, the 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 correct city is Niterói. Wow. Wow. Let's see. I still have my hobbies like this one. This is a. Uh, I received it today. There are still people here who create hardware mm -hmm. for uh -huh. computers. Uh -huh. This one, it's an MSX cartridge that has a, a 
a VDP, a next um, VDP. Oh wow! I don't know. I don't understand what that is. So Adam, you know the the video chip and the video the, processor. Yeah, oh, a, yeah. Okay. It's, a, it's an it's an advanced version of the chip that was in the TI ninety nine. Okay. They, was they, that used in the MSX three standard or something? Yeah, yeah. It was okay. real popular with the MSX. Okay. That's very cool. Uh, I have a lot of gadgets here. <laughs> well, that uh, reminds me, wasn't there a, an expansion for the 1000 that used that chip? Yep. Yep. Yeah, okay. A guy named John Oliger and Fred Nackbauer worked on it together. John did the hardware and Fred did the um, uh, the edits to the to the ROM so that it would work seamlessly. So, you know, you plug these two cartridges into an, ex you know, these, an expansion board and um you'd activate it and then all of your you know timex video well all of your timex text and graphics whatever would go through the uh the 9918 and display you know in color and stuff and you wouldn't have the flashing that you're experiencing with the 1000 because oh, it doesn't yeah. redraw the screen I that don't way dig that at all yeah it's very yeah in slow mode. It's very frustrating on the one thousand, as you have discovered. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm actually glad I'm discovering that because I haven't programmed on the one thousand before, or well, I'm not programming on it. I'm typing in a basic program. Yeah. So it's interesting to find, um, and use it as someone would have used it forty years yeah. ago. Yeah. So I mean, you're you're getting the firsthand experience of real hardware. So yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and that that whole redrawing the screen after you enter one mm. line. Yeah, I was I was shocked to see that. I was like, <laughs> honestly like, what is happening here? I was like looking through the manual today, going, "Well, how do I turn this off?" I'm, I know there's a way to turn this off. Mm -mm. No, mm -mm. no, and and actually, Adam, the the that was an improvement. The ZX80 was all fast mode, and so you know you'd type stuff in, and the screen would be flashing like that, like in fast mode. Um, uh, because it didn't generate the video signal. I can't remember exactly when it when when it did its thing, but you know, when you typed, it would stop generating the video signal. Um, and I think that there were some processing points at which it would not generate a video signal. So, so wait, you were typing in the dark? You couldn't see what you were typing? No, you could see. But what happened oh. is that the screen would flash every time you yeah. pressed the key. On the yeah, ZX, ZX80 didn't have slow mode. It was always running it fast. Yeah. Oh. That was an epileptic test. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. That's what well, I was saying and, earlier. Um, yeah. I had that point. So that that's why today. I said I can't I can't do that. Yeah. 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 Audio. Uh get on the uh groups.io list. Um it's it's in the comments of of the videos uh on YouTube and and come back because we love the international perspective <laughs> Gustavo well, well, I'm, I'm proud of david for accepting him because now there's a waiting room and who knows you know now. right right <laughs> well i took a risk i took a right. risk <laughs> i was like hmm this doesn't look like a a risky kind of guy <laughs> um yeah yeah come back um because we you know we'd love to hear about your programming projects um Thank you, Bob, for sharing, uh, you know, your your days as a, a middle school band instructor, programming a, a you know, teacher's grade book. Um, and Mike, thanks for for joining us and telling us about your your crazy experiences. Mike and I have actually been emailing a bit. He tells me what's going on, and he's also very active on Facebook. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, and I'm wrapping up is what's happening. It's it's ten fifty nine, and the bar is closing. <laughs> My bar it's is really open. <laughs> it's really too bad that we don't have that class uh, that class program still somewhere. That'd be uh, really well, interesting to archive that. But you know, hey, it, it is what it is. But um, um, Bob looked up looked up the name, and it was Dennis Silvestri, and and I think I have enough information to track track him down. Hopefully, he's still around and still has has a collection and we'll see if we see if we can get him and and get that preserved <laughs> so what it well, was so what eventually did because I, I know you said you you mailed a lot of cassettes out to people uh so all that timex stuff you just uh, threw that in a bin at some point in time <laughs> uh 
Oh, you're still on mute. Yeah, Bob, let me uh, ask you to unmute. Where did you go? Okay. There you now? go. Yep. Okay. There you go. Um, I don't remember exactly when I got rid of it. I, I know I had a lot of old stuff when I moved to Hawaii. That was 2002. But uh, I remember at some point I thought, whether it was that stuff or other stuff from Apple II, I don't know. But I got to the point where I was like, why am I holding on to this anymore? And then I was a tiny little, tiny little apartment. Things are too expensive in Hawaii to have anything big. And so I finally got rid of a lot of stuff. But I might have gotten rid of the Timex stuff even sooner. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, probably. Yeah. Well, dig dig through your uh, dig through your boxes and see what you can find. <laughs> I'll check. Cool. <laughs> cool. Can I ask yeah. one final question of you, Bob, before you unmute? Sure. Uh, how long did you use your program? When did you stop using it? Well, that's a good question. Um, I'm not even sure when I first wrote, started. I wrote it where in a sense it was useful. But uh, I assume it was, well, it almost had to be in the 1982, early 83 range because I did get the 2068 and I ported it to the 2068. So I had to have already, at least most of it had to be written. Um, and... Uh, so let's see. I I know I was still doing the extensions program uh, in 1987. So uh, therefore, I still use my Timex. Mm -hmm. uh, and then sometime between 87 and 1990, I bought the Apple II GS. I've been trying to rack my brain. I lived, I lived several places. I kind of picture myself in front of the computer. And what <laughs> computer was in front of me? And I can, I know in 1990 I can see that Apple II GS. But what, what I can't imagine what I was using before that. And I, I said, like three different places I lived, and I can't even picture it. Hmm. That's fantastic. I can't picture the one. That's the problem. <laughs> I, I guess the last thing we have to wrap up, David, is the next meeting. Yep. Next meeting is uh, Sunday. Let me just skip ahead a bit. April. Um, wrong calendar. Okay. Uh, I hope 17? it's not Easter. I, would, I hope I don't have it set for Easter Sunday. <laughs> well, I think Easter Sunday is the ninth, right? That's next so. Sunday. Yeah. Yeah. So the Sunday after that is the sixteenth. Yep. Yep. Sunday sixteenth. That's thank you very much. Um, and well, no, the sixteenth is Easter, right? Oh no, that no, would be no, Orthodox. It's on the, it's on the ninth. That's, or, that's Orthodox Easter. Sorry. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, because I was going to say oh, Easter well. should be next Sunday or this coming Sunday. Yes. Yes. yes this coming right. Sunday. But our next meeting is April 16th at 2 p.m. Eastern time. Um, and uh, Chuck Durang, who wrote the manuals for the 1000 and the 2068, will be joining us. So if you have any complaints about those manuals, they'll be there. <laughs> I think I think Ad, Adam's going to geek out because he's. <laughs> well, you know, I actually thought he was on today until just a few hours before the meeting, and I and I took out the the book. I was going to be like, okay, I have a question for you, but. <laughs> yeah, no, he's got some cool stories about about how he sort of fell into into doing those manuals, um, and it'll be fun to to hear him talk about that, and then you know, talk about whatever whatever we want to after that. On that note. Gentlemen, thanks again. It's been a great evening, and um, yeah. we'll see you in two weeks ish. <laughs>